you, Deborah, uh, for that very generous uh, welcome and, and introduction. Uh, just by way of segueing, let me note that if you buy the book here and now, I'll be happy to sign it. Uh, number one. Number two, uh, as Deborah mentioned, we do disagree on some things. And there is a disclaimer on what I write for APN. Uh, but uh, I am very happy to appear on behalf of APN, uh, having had working relationships with virtually every American Jewish organization in the course of the past, uh, ever since I left the Mossad in government service, so that's 30 some years. Uh, nothing compares to this organization uh, for its, uh, its very generous approach to pluralism in discussing the issues, uh, which is why we get along so well. And while I've not, I'm not a member of Peace Now, and I never have been, uh, let me begin by saying uh, what you're going to hear from me is pretty depressing. Uh, but it, the, the role it leaves for Peace Now is more important than ever. And I'll get back to that uh, toward the end and be happy to, to elaborate on it. Uh, uh, I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, despite the fact that Deborah, certainly you all know who I am, I, I want to introduce myself in the context of Israel-Palestine um, because uh, I need to persuade you uh, that uh, uh, I'm knowledgeable enough to be saying the tough things that I'm going to be saying and to be drawing the tough conclusions that I'm going to be drawing. Uh, so my credentials dealing with the Palestinian issue, they go all the way back to my career in the Mossad, but that I can't talk about. But uh, beginning way back in uh, 1981, the Jaffe Center for Strategic Studies, uh, I was the, uh, the chief researcher who authored the study, uh, the landmark study on the options for a Palestinian settlement back in 1989, and put in the mainstream of the Israeli public discussion the notion that we had to talk to the PLO we're going back to the days of Yitzhak Shamir, okay? Uh, we have to talk to the PLO, and we have to talk about a Palestinian state. Uh, I've also run a lot of track two informal dialogues between Israelis and Palestinians. I'm the only person who ever got together the leaders of the Gush Emunim settler movement and Yasser Arafat's personal representatives, uh, which ended uh, in a book uh, uh, as well, uh, which only appeared in Hebrew, uh, and the wolf shall dwell with the wolf. So you can figure what that book uh, is about. Uh, I, advised I advised Prime Minister Barak during the July 2000 uh, Camp David talks. And uh, from 2001 to 2012, together with a Palestinian colleague, Bassan Khatib, produced Bitter Lemons, uh, which was a fairly unique uh, virtual exchange of views. Uh, first and foremost between Israelis and Palestinians, but eventually the, uh, the entire Middle East, and its demise very much parallels <coughs> the downward turn of Israeli-Palestinian relations. Uh, <coughs> next year, 50 years of the occupation. And in those 50 years, a roughly one-tenth of the Jewish population of Israel has transferred its address across the Green Line, whether in East Jerusalem or in the West Bank. We're talking about some 600,000 people and 10% of the population, and that's a lot. And we are at a point where I would uh, suggest that the Oslo process as we know it has run its course and is over. And we have to begin thinking post-Oslo. Uh, and post-Oslo means we are, we and the Palestinians are on a slippery slope sliding slowly towards some kind of very ugly one-state reality. As matters stand, this is where we're going. How long it's going to take, what it's going to look like, I don't know. Anybody who purports to predict anything in the Middle East today has to be taken, uh, uh, listened to very cautiously. I can only describe where we are, and we are on a very negative slippery slope towards something very negative with 
I would suggest zero prospects for a productive peace process. For a productive, not even, not even a, or produ productive two-state process, not even a productive process of no end of conflict, because I have drawn the conclusion from almost 25 years of Oslo that a, a, we are incapable of ending this conflict the way Oslo defined it. Okay, we may be capable of creating a Palestinian state and living in some kind of cautious coexistence, but ending the conflict between us, uh, which is a unique conflict, uh, we're incapable of doing. So the issue, issue is now the slippery slope, and the issue is how to manage it. Uh, it's relatively a, for everybody involved, it's relatively speaking easy at this point to manage the slippery slope because of the surrounding environment. And the surrounding environment from Israel's standpoint has never been so good. Uh, not a single Arab state threatens, threatens us, threatens to destroy us, or even threatens us, or even threatens us. One, there's one country in the Middle East that threatens us, Iran. And then there are the non-state uh, Islamist movements, Sunni and Shiite, uh, which threaten, but none of them, Iran, since the nuclear deal and uh, Hamas and Hezbollah, none of them constitutes an existential threat to Israel. The only existential threat we face today is the threat to Israel as a Jewish democratic Zionist state. It's the slippery slope. It's a very different e existential threat. It's not physical uh, attack or even uh, uh, attempt to, to exterminate. Uh, and I would suggest that all the parties involved, the policymakers in Washington, the policymakers in Brussels, uh, the policymakers in Jerusalem and in Ramallah and everywhere else, uh, the uh, diaspora, the Jewish diaspora, particularly here, uh, have to change their agenda. Uh, the agenda can no longer be just get to the damn table quoting Leon Panetta. The agenda can no longer be the outlines of an agreement are perfectly clear. The parties just have to sit down. Uh, John Kerry, Tony Blair. Uh, the agenda today has to be, what does this slippery slope look like? Where is it heading? How can we slow the slide until something else comes along? How can we manage this slippery slope? Because this is what's happening. And any other agenda is an illusion. And when we hear statements like this, we Israelis, Palestinians, other Arabs, they sound ludicrous. They sound pathetic. They, they signal a total lack of understanding. Now, a, a, the lack of understanding, I would suggest, begins with a failure to analyze what went wrong with the Oslo process. Because the agenda, whenever somebody of goodwill it comes to try to mediate and to uh, uh, re reactivate the peace process, the agenda is the Oslo agenda. The agenda is the Oslo DOP menu of final status issues, coupled with the slogan, which is not written in Oslo, but which is written in stone somewhere, apparently, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. And uh, because the Oslo agenda which in its day was a huge breakthrough and made a great deal of sense. Uh, but because in retrospect, looking, trying to learn from the failures, uh, it, the Oslo agenda was faulty. Uh, it, has to, it has to change. We need a post-Oslo paradigm. Call it a new 242 if you like. It doesn't have to be the UN. Uh, a, but a, it has to be a, a, a radically a new agenda. Uh, the old agenda has generated a, a series of, of failed strategies. Uh, and I'll a, a address uh, Kerry's, Kerry's recent attempt and, and the even more recent attempt that involved uh, President Sisi in a minute. Uh, 
But uh, let me ask, how did we get where we are? It, it seemed pretty obvious to us, to many of us, but it's worth uh, reiterating. Uh, religious extremism has grown on both sides. Israeli, Palestinian, I would say on all sides because it's all around us in the Middle East. And uh, uh, in Israel, it, uh, the, the catalyst was the occupation and uh, going back to 1968 when left-wing governments in Israel began to allow settlement in, in the West Bank. Uh, and this fueled the Gush Emunim movement, uh, which is today snowballed into a, a, a radical messianic Jewish movement, which has managed to place itself very much in the dynamic mainstream of Israeli politics. Uh, on the Palestinian or on the Arab side, uh, particularly since 2011, we witnessed the rise of a variety of, uh, before 2011, a variety of uh, radical Islamist movements. Uh, the, uh, and since 2011, the virtual collapse of five, of five or six Arab states, beginning in January 2011 in Tunis and Cairo. Uh, and the Israeli public, even the moderate Israeli public, will be forgiven if it looks around and says, this is not exactly the time to create another Arab state particularly one composed of the West Bank in Gaza and one that's already fragmented. One that fragmented before January 2011 uh, between the West Bank and Gaza, between the PLO uh, uh, and, and Hamas. Uh, the, one of the a less noticed side effects of the entire Oslo process has been the radicalization of the leadership of the Israeli Arab community, that is the Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel. Uh, not so much the rank and file, but a, the intellectual leadership and the political leadership as represented in the Knesset a, adopt a position regarding a, a Israel that is more radical than that of the PLO, our negotiating party. The PLO says it will reach an agreement with the State of Israel. It can define itself the, more or less the way it wants whereas the leadership of the Israeli Arab community says Israel has to be a binational state. And there are all kinds of documents that they've issued in recent years to back this up. Now, they're perfectly within their rights to express their view, but the reaction of the Israeli Jewish majority has been to be all the more suspicious of what, how the Israeli Arab community will behave if we do reach a two-state solution. They will, that they will see it as a way as just a step toward uh, changing the very uh, nature of Israel. And this is one more reason uh, uh, to take an extreme position against the Palestinian state. Another reason is the outcome of the unilateral withdrawal from the Gaza Strip in 2005 under Ariel Sharon. In the Israeli narrative, and I, I'm perfectly aware that the Palestinians have a different narrative, but in the Israeli narrative, uh, it, this was a, uh, a, a should have created the conditions for successful Palestinian state building in a clearly defined piece of land with whose borders are agreed between the two sides with a large input of international financial aid to spur it on uh, and instead it resulted in chaos and it resulted in a minor Palestinian civil war and the Hamas takeover and we've had three a mini wars uh, with Hamas in Gaza ever since. And this certainly fuels the political position of the Israeli right wing, which says this is what happens when you give up territory. Uh, uh, so we shouldn't, we, we shouldn't or we can't uh, uh, do it again. Uh, on the Palestinian side, the rise of Hamas, uh, this perception that Hamas uh, 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 which uh, is essentially the Muslim Brotherhood and uh, which holds fast to its tenet that Israel has no right to exist and indeed that the protocols of the elders of Zion still exist. You can read their charter. Uh, they won't deny it. Uh, and they threaten, very much threaten, to take over the West Bank in the post-Abu Mazen era, which will fall upon us who knows when. 
Uh, and there, here too, there's a great, this, this again fuels the opposition to uh, any kind of territorial compromise uh, uh, by Israel. Uh, where does this put us today? Let me give you a, two examples of misguided peace processes by well-meaning people who failed to draw the lessons of Oslo. But let me begin with the two key lessons of Oslo. One I already mentioned, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, means that the parties can agree on 90% of the contents of a two-state solution, and if they don't agree on the other 10%, and we've been there, we've been there, uh, then they don't agree. And the next time, 10 years later, you start afresh, because you have different Israeli positions and different Palestinian positions. Uh, the key issues, or the key, uh, the key issues that have been impossible to agree on, are what I call the pre-67 issues, or the narrative issues, or the existential issues, as opposed to the post-67 issues. Now, Oslo, the Oslo DOP makes a mishmash of them. It didn't distinguish, and at the time we didn't know how. We didn't know to distinguish. We didn't understand what it would be like negotiating this, but. It's about time we learn. In a series of negotiations, particularly uh, Camp David 2000, July 2000, El Barak, and Olmert Abu Mazen in, uh, ending in uh, de September 2008, uh, we've come close to agreeing on the territorial issue. Uh, Olmert and Abu Mazen were about one percentage point apart in terms of where do you move the green line for Israel to hold on to settlement blocks and. Palestinians to get Israeli territory and compensation. All, both Olmert and Barak offered the Palestinians a capital in East Jerusalem. Uh, a, a, they weren't too far apart on this. The security issues were eminently negotiable whenever we've tried to do them. Uh, Palestinian airspace, the electromagnetic sphere of the Jordan Valley, and, and uh, uh, its security coordination, and so on and so forth. Um, where we've made, we have made, to the best of my knowledge, zero progress is on, and the, my, these issues, the ones I just enumerated, these are post-67 issues. These are the kind, we, are, we negotiated them with Egypt, we negotiated them with Jordan, we negotiated them with Syria. Uh, and of course, one can uh, uh, rejoice in the fact that we didn't reach an agreement that, that caused us to give up the Golan, but that's a different story. Uh, a, the pre-67 issues, the two primary ones are holy places and the right of return of the 1948 refugees. And here we've made zero progress. And, I want, and, and when I say the right of return, I want to distinguish between refugees and the right of return. Uh, we've made progress on how many 1948 refugees Israel might agree to take in. When Olmert and Abu Mazen parted, he said 10,000 and Abu Mazen said 100,000. Sounds like a big gap, but not when you consider that, according to UNRWA and the Palestinians, there are over 5 million uh, refugees, meaning basically the great-grandchildren of refugees. This is a, a unique definition of refugees, which unfortunately uh, nobody has been able to change. But the right of return, the consistent Palestinian demand it is part of an end of conflict. Israel recognized the right of all of them to return. All of them. Uh, which Israel rejects. And there, there's been no movement on this. And holy places, particularly the Temple Mount, the Palestinian assertion at the negotiating table, first Arafat, then Abu Mazen, and Abu Mazen repeats it at least once every half year, there never was a temple on the Temple Mount. What are you people talking about? Now, this is a total re rewriting of Islamic historiography, which until 100 years ago recognized that the mosques were built on top of the ruins of the temple precisely because Islam supersedes Judaism. So the mosques are on top. Uh, a, but the Palestinians have completely rewritten this. And this is why Olmer could make such a far-reaching offer for some sort of international consortium to manage the the Holy Basin in Jerusalem, a consortium with a majority of uh, Muslim Arab countries on it, uh, which would decide what happens in the Jewish quarter and at the wall, and Abu Mazen could reject. We remain oceans apart 
on these narrative issues. Uh, and the Israeli response to the Palestinian positions has been uh, to uh, recognize that what the Palestinians are seeking is that in the course of ending the conflict, Israel in effect recognizes that the state of Israel was born in sin, right of return. If they all have the right of return, it's because we were wrong and they were right. And uh, uh, that uh, there is no such thing as a Jewish people with roots in the Holy Land, which is why there never was a temple on the Temple Mount. And of course, the Israeli response has been since Camp David 2000, uh, you have to recognize this as a Jewish state, uh, which is also a pre-67 issue and is also a non-starter from the standpoint of the Palestinians and, and for that matter, almost all Arabs uh, uh, whom I encounter. Okay, so now we get to John Kerry, 2000, summer 2013, comes to the region to restart the peace process according to the Oslo formula, according to the Oslo menu, according to the nothing is agreed until, unless everything is agreed. And the first item on his agenda with Abu Mazen is recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Uh, and then the second item is uh, the 67 lines, uh, or whatever. Uh, absolutely no indication that lessons were learned that might change the menu. And Kerry brought with him over 100 people, spin doctors, uh, PR people, a, a opinion pollers, uh, generated huge optimism on both sides uh, just by dint of the energy uh, expended. Uh, and never had a chance. Never had a chance. The, the, uh, Abu Mazen and, and Netanyahu never got together. They never met. And of course, here again, go back to lessons of Oslo. You're talking about two recalcitrant leaders, Abu Mazen, who, who since 2008 has given up on negotiating with Israel because he knows he can't make the concessions that are the basic red line for the Israelis. So he's given up negotiating. And Netanyahu, who never gives up negotiating, but is, is in, but covers the West Bank and will use negotiating as a, as a cover to advance his real agenda, look at the nature of his coalitions one after the other, and he does it extremely skillfully. So that by the end of this process, Kerry is maneuvered to a position where Netanyahu says, yes, but, and Abu Mazen says no. Uh, and Abu Mazen is, is summoned to President Obama, who says, look, here's, what, here's, our, here's our offer. What do you say? And Abu Mazen says, I'll let you know, and walks out without giving an answer, and goes home and phones Hamas, and for the nth time since 2007, says let's form a unity government, and we'll set up a committee to discuss it. This is his response to Kerry and Obama's pressures, which were minor. I mean, if you're going to try to run a peace process with the likes of Abu Mazen and Netanyahu, you better enter with a sledgehammer of pressures if you expect to get anything out of them, which Kerry didn't do. Uh, so Abu Mazen invites Hamas, and Hamas says, fine, uh, our first condition is give us a freer hand in the West Bank. And with a freer hand in the West Bank, they go out and kidnap three yeshiva students and murder them. And within a month, we're back at war with Hamas. I would suggest that there is an indirect link between a failed peace process, failed failure known miro, known in advance, uh, a, the Kerry's process of 2013-14 and the summer 2014 war. Uh, the lesson is, if you go into this without learning the lessons of previous failures, you're not only going to fail again, you're going to make things worse. Most recent example, just last month. Uh, Bibi is feeling the pressures from the EU. The French are convening a, a, some sort of convocation which met on June 3rd in Paris, and they have plans for more. Uh, and. Uh, uh, he also hears the rumors that Obama, uh, in his lame duck period between November 8th and January 20th, is going to launch some sort of new guidelines, a la Clinton guidelines or something else, maybe something at the UN, 
And uh, all of this makes me be nervous. So he calls up Herzog, the leader of the uh, Labour Party, who is a total political novice. Uh, let's set up a unity government. We need to have a peace process. And uh, Tsipi Livni hears this and whispers in Herzog's ear, I've been through this before. Don't believe a word he's saying. And half of the Knesset contingent of Labour says to Herzog, we won't join this government with you. We don't believe a word he's saying. And Herzog moves ahead. And he and Bibi agree, ostensibly, that the peace process will be based on some form of Israeli conditioned recognition of the Arab Peace Initiative of, uh, of uh, 2002, the so-called Saudi peace plan. And with this, they summon uh, who else but Tony Blair and John Kerry and dispatch them to Cairo, uh, extract from President Sisi a statement welcome, which Sisi willingly gives because Sisi needs to, Sisi's under huge international pressure over human rights issues. I mean, everybody was ever involved in the Arab Spring in, in Egypt is in jail today. Uh, he needs weapons, uh, and uh, so he needs to please the United States uh, and the European Union. And so Sisi makes a, pop, a speech in which he says, I welcome the readiness of Israeli parties, parties uh, to a, a, a reopen the peace process based on the Arab Peace Initiative. And this was supposed to be the congenial regional backdrop to Bibi and Bouji Herzog declaring a unity government. And what does Bibi do? He says to Herzog, well, some other time, and he brings in Lieberman. And the first thing Bibi and Lieberman do when they've set up the government is they appear in front of the nation and they say, we want to renew, we welcome Sisi's remarks and we want to renew the peace process based on the Arab Peace Initiative with changes. <laughs> uh, at which point Sisi says, I didn't mean that. And the Saudi foreign minister says, no changes. Uh, and we now, as a result of these efforts by truly well-meaning people who haven't learned the lessons, we have a more right-wing government than we had before. And any idea that they're really going to be partners to any serious peace process is ridiculous. It's simply ridiculous. They paid their lip service. There are true people on, there are people on the Israeli right who dream of, uh, uh, of totally rewriting the Arab Peace Initiative so that basically the Arab world takes the Palestinians off our hands, okay? Uh, uh, but uh, uh, there's no uh, Arab uh, uh, partner for this. Uh, so where are we? Where, are we? where might we be heading on this slippery slope? First of all, the dominant right wing in Israel, which is now the mainstream, uh, it has a fascinating array of ideas of what to do with the West Bank, uh, a, which are important to pay attention to just because this is the thinking on the right. This is the thinking of the people who are running the country uh, and avoiding any kind of a peace process. So you begin with President Rivlin uh, at one end of the spectrum, a true liberal in the 19th century meaning of the word, a Jabotinsky liberal, who says, uh, on the one hand, we have to hold on to all the territory between the river and the sea. It's the land of Israel. But on the other, we have to give equal rights to everybody. So everybody will be a citizen. And when confronted with the fact that this means that Israel will no longer, will very quickly cease to be a Jewish state or cease to be a democratic state, uh, he begins to backtrack. Well, the, the, there'll be some conditions um, some citizenship conditions. There'll be an Arab vice president. Uh, that's what Jabotinsky suggested 100 years ago. Uh, we don't have a vice president office, but it's okay. Uh, there'll be an Arab vice president, and he begins to hedge. Uh, go to the other extreme, Naftali Bennett, uh, who says a, a not one state and not two states, two states, but the 
a Palestinian authority, that is to say areas A and B, 40-42% 40, 40, of the West Bank, uh, will remain autonomous and will, it will, will it enhance their autonomy, will build them bypasses and, uh, and tunnels and will bring high-tech investment to Ramallah. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we will uh, improve their uh, standard of living and they'll be satisfied. And, and it's, this, is ev this is apartheid in everything but name, in everything but name. And in the middle, all kinds of other notions like the, the Palestinian, two and, two and a half million Palestinians of areas A and B will be Jordanian citizens. Nobody asked the Jordanians if they, they would agree, but they'll be Jordanian citizens. And my favorite is Carolyn Glick of the Jerusalem Post, maybe some of you encounter her writing, who says, hey, give them all citizenship. Annex the West Bank, give them all citizenship, but there are two and a half million Palestinians there. There are only one and a half million Palestinians there. All the demographers are wrong. She has her own private demographer somewhere. Palestinian demographers are wrong, Israeli, international, they're only one and a half million. And that's doable because one million American Jews will make Aliyah, will come to Israel to balance things out. This is her scheme. One of the editors of the Jerusalem Post and a very welcome speaker at, at, at right wing forums. So in this atmosphere, uh, in the absence of anybody learning lessons from Oslo, uh, with Israel uh, under right-wing messianists, increasingly, uh, who are spreading the settlements, with the Arab world in disarray, with the Palestinian world in disarray, Palestine split between two entities, between two movements, Abu Mazen aging, increasingly just clinging to power, no, not clear to anybody what happens afterwards, and with all the other inputs to Israelis turning right that I mentioned, we're going to be sliding down this slippery slope. And uh, uh, we have to look for ways to manage this. Uh, we have to look to, for ways to keep the Z Jewish Zionist democratic ideal alive, to fight settlement expansion. Here, by the way, is where an organization like Peace Now plays, plays an absolutely vital role, telling the world what's going on. Uh, and we have to look for stopgap measures. And increasingly, the Israeli center and left is, is not looking for an end of conflict peace process. It's increasingly looking, I'm, I'm including Herzog, I'm including the 300 commanders, the generals, I don't know if you've been exposed to their ideas recently, uh, uh, increasingly are looking for ways just, they wouldn't use my terminology, but ways just to slow the slide down the slippery slope. So when these 300 commanders come out and say, plug the gaps in the fence, keep Palestinian illegals out of Israel, allow more Palestinian legals to work in Israel, uh, offer incentives for settlers to leave. Uh, these are all very, very partial pinpoint measures uh, that will are generally not welcomed by the Palestinian leadership because it fears that if any pal partial measures or partial withdrawals are welcomed by the world, the world will see this as the end of the conflict, as the end of the territorial issue, and will be less interested in fostering a, 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 a comprehensive solution. Uh, but these are ways to at least uh, mitigate uh, the slide. And, and why can I advocate this without being totally depressed about where we're going? Because we have to recognize that in our part of the world, none of the main strategic turning points are predicted. Uh, when uh, uh, the Yom Kippur War was a surprise, and it changed Israeli attitudes radically with regard to territories for peace. It was a tragedy, but Israelis were much more ready to deal after that. When Sadat announced in the Egyptian parliament on November 9th, 1977 that he's coming to Israel, even though there had been extensive a, a secret negotiations between uh, the Israeli and the Egyptian leadership in, under the auspices of King Hassan and, of Morocco, we were surprised. He, that wasn't part of the script. He trumped, he trumped the cards. Uh, 
the events of 2000, the, well, the Rabin assassination, uh, the events of 2011 in the Arab world, totally unpredicted, totally unexpected. And I would suggest the one thing I can predict is that there will be more such totally unpredictable uh, events that could be catas cataclysmic, they could be positive. And I will, by way of concluding, just regale you with a few thoughts of, of possible examples, not because this is what will happen, but because we've got to keep our minds very open and know how to exploit changes in the region if and as uh, uh, they happen. Uh, the Saudi number three, the young prince, is in Washington now. He's in the States. He's in Silicon Valley, wherever he is. Uh, who's full of surprises. Yemen, uh, uh, putting the Saudi uh, the Aramco on the stock market. Uh, uh, is it conceivable that someone like this will say, you know, we're already in close strategic cooperation with the Israelis because we Sunni states that have survived the Arab Spring a, a share with the Israelis a, a strong apprehension of militant Islam in the region, whether it's militant uh, Shiite Islam, that is Iran slash Hezbollah, or militant Sunni Islam, which of course the Saudis are partially responsible for, uh, a, a Qaeda, a Daesh, a ISIS, uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, and so on and so forth. Um, maybe it's time to take this a step further. We say to the Israelis, you know, I'll come to Jerusalem, I'll speak in the Knesset, I'll give you total normalization, I'll let you make the Hajj. Eh? <laughs> but my condition is, under my auspices, solve the, you're going to solve this Palestinian issue. Uh, I guarantee you this would turn Israeli public opinion around over here, and probably Palestinian public opinion as well. It, I, I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm saying, but I am saying there are things happening in the Gulf. Uh, where, which is moving toward increasing strategic cooperation with Israel, which is increasingly, in general, the Arab leaders is increasingly fed up with the Palestinians uh, and saying to them, you had opportunities, you were up, up, made, you got decent offers, you turned them down, uh, do something, we're fed up. Uh, and so something might come out of this. On the other side of the ledger, the United Nations is predicting that within a few years, uh, Gazans will be totally destitute. They don't have enough water, they don't have enough food. But what happens when everybody in Gaza starves? What is this going to do to uh, uh, Israel's image under international law? We're still seen as the occupiers of Gaza, even though in our own narrative we no longer are. Um, uh, what effect will this have now? Apparently there's going to be an agreement with Turkey. The latest is it will be announced next week. A, according to which the Turks will in effect feed the Gazans. Uh, what, will, what effect will that have? Could it have some positive effect on Israeli-Hamas uh, uh, relations? Uh, what happens after Abu Mazen? Uh, good news or bad news? Uh, bad news could mean total chaos in the West Bank, a Hamas attempted takeover, something that would draw the Israeli military in and make us once again occupiers even of areas A and B. Good news might be a Palestinian leader who feels less beholden to the generation of the original refugees, which is Abu Mazen, uh, and, and might be prepared to uh, take a new departure. There are ruminations in Jordan uh, that uh, if things go bad in the West Bank and they fear the flight of Palestinians to the East Bank, that is to Jordan, that Jordan has to take a Palestinian initiative. Uh, for the first time since 1988, 80, huh? 88, 88 yeah. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I can only end this presentation by noting that uh, a, we're on a slippery slope. There's absolutely no indication we're getting off it anytime soon. Uh, there are ways to slow the slide. There are ways to mitigate the, the worst aspects. Uh, we need to change the agenda. The think tanks need to change the agenda. The policy planners need to change the agenda. It has to become a post-Oslo agenda. 
Uh, the American Jewish community has to change the agenda. I've been talking to American Jewish groups. This is a very painful issue. Uh, when I say American Jews have to begin talking differently to their children and grandchildren about Jewish values in light of the slippery slope. Now, this is the, it, there's no problem talking about this in Israel. We're all yelling at one another day in and day out. Uh, uh, there was no reason for me to write my book in Hebrew because it's, the contents are in 10 op-eds a day, okay, and in every talk show on TV. Uh, and when you have Eud Barak saying fascism, uh, you know that this is, has become a very deep and, and very serious conversation in Israel. And the American Jewish community and Israel are and should be and must continue to be strategic allies. And it, it, it's, it, there's something wrong when Israelis are going at it in this way, in such an open way. Uh, and the American Jewish community is not, to the best of what I can see, as a community, as congregations, as grandparents and grandchildren. Uh, so with that, I close my presentation. Sorry if I depressed you, Deborah, uh, and be happy to open the discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Can you be more specific about what we should be telling our children? No, I won't be more specific. I'm an Israeli. You guys figure it out. No, I don't think it's proper. I'm just saying I don't hear, I don't hear this discussion. I don't hear this discussion of values. And I've talked to some prominent American Jewish leaders uh, about it. And one of them said to me just the other day, he said, we can't. We don't dare. Well, that's, think about that. Think about that. I can't tell, I can't, I, I can only say I don't see it happening and it's not healthy. Not that what's happening in Israel is healthy. Not that the Jewish values that you have to talk about that are coming out of Israel are healthy. But it's not healthy not to, not to be talking. James Norman, uh, I'm Jewish. Uh, a biography of Albert Einstein describes how he used thought experiments to resolve fundamental problems of physics. He disregarded experimental facts, used imagination to try and resolve problems. I suggest a similar exercise now, disregarding all the unhappy, unhelpful facts that we know about, and instead using a bit of imagination to conceive of something which is unthinkable. I just gave you a list. All right. That's that's my thought experiment. Okay, so let's imagine that the objective pursued by the American government for many years, getting the leaders on both sides, to negotiate and come up with an agreed upon peace formula. Question number one, how would this agreement between leaders change the situation? Second, would it change anything? Third, if not, why Look, there's no agreement between leaders. If there were. It's uh, th there is a, I'm sorry, I, my imagination is limited. There is a, an alarming leadership deficit on but both sides. Were, In fact, were. you can say all over the world there's a leadership deficit, but certainly between Israelis and Palestinians. We have a prime minister who is a political genius, okay? He is an absolute genius at manipulating and maneuvering everybody, including Tony Blair and John Kerry, okay, in order to stay in office and slowly, very cautiously, advance an agenda of holding on to the territory uh, in, in the West Bank. On the Palestinian side, there is a leader who understands what the Oslo agenda is and can't deal with it. I mean the, the pre-67 agenda. Simply cannot deal with it. Uh, uh, I, now, uh, who, who, will, who would you, in your thought experiment, have replaced them? I don't know, because the replacements were, could be worse. If there were, if there were, how would that change anything? I'm sorry. I, I, I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, you're, you're looking at a reality in which uh, I began by describing that the virtual dialogue that I managed with a Palestinian partner for 12 years, Bitter Lemons, bit the dust in 2012, 
and it's symptomatic of the fact that Israelis and Palestinians no longer talk to them. Okay, uh, they're no longer inform. There are far fewer informal discussions today or virtual discussions. This this is where we are. Where you are, it's admirable, but it's so far away from what we can grasp and do something with that I I can't get. I don't have another answer. I'm sorry. Sorry. Let's let. If we have time, we'll come back to it. Yeah. I um, I know this is probably not perceived <coughs> by some as immediate, but during one of the presidential debates over here, um, the, the question was asked one of the, one of the Democratic debates, what's the most important security issue? And Bernie Sanders said, climate change. And I have to think that in the Middle East, it's hot. It's crowded. It is not... You know, there had, I, I'm sure that the environmental thing plays a role in this. I don't know exactly what it is. Sometimes I think the wave of Syrian immigrants, is, the migrants, is the first wave of environmental refugees. Can, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this as a question, but can you address at all the role of environment in all of this? Look, I don't know if Bernie Sanders is a, a, an expert on climate change. I don't think so. Um, I'm not. <laughs> so I can I can give you an, an amateur's uh, response. Clearly, climate change has played a role in the Arab Spring. In Syria, drought, which was not properly dealt with by a dysfunctional government, uh, impoverished large numbers of uh, farmers who then moved to the cities. Uh, and in one particular city in South Syria, the revolution began. And you can say that the immediate catalyst was climate change. You can, but you can, of course, say it's the fault of Sykes-Picot 100 years ago and uh, dysfunctional government and mistakes by uh, whoever. Uh, in Yemen, there's a similar story because they rely on a, a mild narcotic called cut. If you ever want to stay awake for 24 hours, chew cut and drink Coca-Cola. Uh, a, I, I, I tried this in Yemen. It works. Uh, a, but it, it requires a lot of water and there's climate change there too. And they're running out of water and this is undoubtedly one of the factors in that, uh, that uh, were involved. Now, uh, I hesitate to go any further with this because if you go back 10 or 15 years in Israel, all right, we were running out of water, okay? We were beginning to ration water. You can't water your lawn for July and August uh, because we were running out of water. And uh, the uh, along came improved techniques of desalination and of uh, recycling of wastewater. And we became almost overnight world leaders in both. And we have more water than we know what to do with today. All right? We could use water to pave, to, to grease the wheels of improved relations with our neighbors. We're already selling water at a cut rate to Jordan. Some of it goes to the Palestinians, not nearly enough. Uh, the Palestinian Gaza needs desalination plants, and it's not our fault they don't have them, okay? It's the fault of all kinds of uh, behavior by Hamas. Uh, but what, uh, you cannot argue in our part of the world that the lack of water uh, is, an is, is going to be a, a major cause of conflict or is a major cause of conflict. So I'm cautious about it. A, a, and of course, if you want to take the Syrian refugee issue further, if you, if it's if it's only environmental, and eight million refugees, and the British are so afraid of being flooded by Muslims, they're going to leave the European Union, and it'll fall apart. It's the chaos theory, the butterfly in where in Brazil, I think, uh, and the U European Union falls apart. But I, I'm not capable of taking any further than that. Yeah. Um, uh, so Dan. So, in talking about a new paradigm, trying to grasp what it might look like, um, my first question relates to President Obama. So, in his remaining six and a half to seven months in office, what might he do to create a new predicate? Do you support the idea of parameters? If he lays out a plan to somehow incorporate the 367 issues that you're talking about, and then what would your advice be to, uh, to a new U.S. President uh, in July? Or uh, you know, I, w I spoke yesterday at the Mid Coast Forum in Maine, uh, a 
along the, what's called the mid coast of Maine, there are a lot of State Department and CIA retirees who get bored. And they invite people like me to speak. Um, and they, of course, ask the same question. And they all, to a man and woman, said, what would you advise Hillary to do? And I said, is nobody going to ask what I advise Trump to do? <laughs> OK. I, I, I will. You will. No, OK. Uh, it, 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 it's easier to start with Trump, OK? I would say to Trump, uh, whose you know, views on the Middle East, if they exist at all, are not familiar to us. The, the, I would say, first, adopt Obama's dictum, don't do stupid shit. <laughs> and secondly, unlike Obama, don't do stupid shit. Not, don't just say it. Don't do it. Until you've, as Trump likes to say, figured out where you are. Okay? That's the only advice you can give. But let's get back to Obama. Uh, look, if he wants to produce a new paradigm, well, first of all, I don't know that he, I, I don't know what he's going to do. But I don't hear that he's going to produce a new paradigm. What I'm afraid of is he'll come out with the same old stuff. He'll come out with the Oslo menu again. Uh, uh, Clinton framed it brilliantly in his day, okay, as his parting shot. It's still a point of reference uh, when the parties uh, talk about ending the conflict, okay? So I'm afraid he'll come out with a formula for ending the conflict, which will inevitably be, ba be based on the Oslo parameters that have failed. I would welcome an attempt to say, I'm, I'm learning from the Oslo failures. And we haven't heard this yet. I'm learning from the Oslo failures. I'm taking the pre-67 issues off the agenda. I have a more limited objective. Set up a Palestinian state. But don't end the conflict. Because you can't. But you, but you can coexist in a much more harmonious way. If you will agree to take these issues off the agenda, now mind you, neither Abu Mazen uh, nor uh, uh, Netanyahu agrees. Uh, but I, I would welcome an effort to create a new paradigm. And if he wants to do this in the UN, and I have this in the book. I mean, I have my own formula. Not that I've managed to sell it to anybody. Uh, but if you want to do this in the UN, this has to be an a post-Oslo new 242. 242 never addressed the Palestinian issue. It doesn't mention the Palestinians. It mentions refugees, but not Palestinian refugees. 242 was a territories for peace formula that once the parties got over their objections and accepted it, within 10 years, it was the basis for Israeli-Egyptian peace, territories for peace. Uh, so you you need, a, you need a new 242 for the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Let me just give you some examples of my creative thinking, okay? Uh, it, you want to recognize East Jerusalem as the future capital of Palestine? Recognize West Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, which the world has never done. Balance it. You want to establish a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza? Recognize that everything you're going to say here and everything that international law says about the sovereignty of states does not apply to Gaza unless and until the recognized rulers of Palestine reestablish rule in Gaza. Because otherwise, the minute the Gazans start firing rockets again and we retaliate, we're attacking a so sovereign Arab state. And all the other Arab states are duty-bound by the Arab League to come to, to come to its aid. Not that they would, but it's just a needless complication, okay? Uh, 67 lines recognize that the parties have gone beyond the 67 lines. They've agreed to swaps. So write that in. It's not written in anywhere. And you can go on and on. The security guarantees for Israel and so on and so forth. And recognize that the priority is to deal with the post-67 issues. Uh, now again, the leadership in the region uh, will not embrace this. Uh, the Arab world is in total disarray. But if you create a new paradigm, it may, in the, as with 242, it may set a new standard for where the parties have to go, for what is, is a, a bit more feasible than the failed Oslo process. 
So that's what I would suggest to Obama. If you want to do something really daring, you want to go to the UN, that's where you should be. But it has to be based on a clear statement. I understand that the old paradigm has failed. We're not going to repeat this again. And that's not where we are, by any means. So in line with your directive, be open to the unexpected, um, what you thinking about the Avon, Sa'ar, others on the right coming forward and posing a strong, well, oh, that's the question. Are they posing a strong alternative? Is anybody listening? Is that uh, you're asking the right questions. My impression is, a, sad to say, at least as of now, uh, this is not a serious challenge to BB's rule. He's just expanded his coalition. There are no indications that this has caused cracks in the coalition. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, Kahlon, uh, who is a liberal, a uh, bolting, or some of the ultra-Orthodox who uh, no, who, you know, they're in, they're in the coalition for entitlements, uh, for their own stuff. Uh, so they're much more flexible on the other issues. Uh, I, I don't see any indications of cracks. Um, Barak uh, is largely discredited in the public eye. Uh, I think, or I'd like to think, that what he is doing in his own mind is playing the elder statesman. I don't care if you like me or not. I'm t speaking truth to power. Do do with it as you will. I mean, that would be a useful role that he would play. If he, if next week he declares he's forming a party, uh, it won't get very far. Now, the history of parties like this that move away from the right or the left to the center I in Israeli politics is not a. I mean, the most successful instance was Kadima, which you know did win two elections, um, uh, and look at Sipi the new today. Whom, whom does she represent? So there's, but okay, there's a lot of, of energy going out around here about getting organized. Um, you have to bear in mind also that people like Sao and uh, Yalon, uh, if they succeed in setting up a right wing party, it's a right wing party. Yalon, who's a kibbutznik, okay? Yalon decided at some point that he's a right winger because as a head of military intelligence, he came to the conclusion, his conclusion, that we do not have a viable Palestinian partner for a two-state solution. And that, to, in his own mind, defined him as a right winger. Okay? Now, that point of view is much more widespread today, at least on the center. The only really strong dis uh, dissenters from that are his merits. Uh, so, could he succeed in forming some sort of centrist party? Well. Okay, but it would be it would be a fragile mix of right and left wing, uh, and with people who have not proven themselves at the polls. Uh, I mean, Yalon tagged along on on Bibi's uh, shirt sleeve. Uh, so, a, we're, and again, the Israeli public is skeptical of generals. Uh, so, my own sense. I mean, I, here I. I would argue with what Deborah said. I don't think this is a, a sort of breakthrough moment. I'd like to think it is. I, I would hope that Deborah is right. Uh, I'm skeptical. There have been no po significant polls to tell us anything yet, and you have to take them with a grain of salt anyway, because Israelis have become poll exhausted. I mean, I just hang up the phone. Uh, so I'm never counted in these polls. Uh, and a lot of people uh, respond like me. Um, and, okay, stable government, no elections on the horizon. Yeah, you can't just make speeches and create elections. You've got to bring down a government. Uh, and uh, th that government is now more solid than before. And uh, I guarantee you, Yalon, Barak, will be old news in another week. That's the Israeli news cycle. I mean, here I come and I put on CNN. I'm amazed they're still talking about Orlando. In the Israeli news cycle, that would have disappeared days ago because we've got new stuff uh, and appear, appear apparently not and that's your good fortune in some ways uh, but uh, uh, I don't I don't see it happening I don't see it happening but at the same time I certainly welcome what Yalon has done 
and said what Barak has said, what the 300 generals have done, because it does it expand the public debate. It brings significant issues like fascist behavior into the mainstream debate. Where, how that's going to percolate and affect things, it's early to say. And with all my skepticism, I welcome this development. I have to tell you, I have a son, some of you may read him, Rogel Alter, writes for Aritz, who's been going on uh, calling people fascists for the last half year. And every time he does it, I sort of cringe and I send him an email and I say, Rogi, Mussolini was a fascist. This is what classic fascism is about. This is not what we're seeing. And he refers me to Umberto Eco's 14 points of fascism and so on and so forth. And this discussion goes on and then along comes Barack. And he says, fascism. And, and before Barack, I think, a, all right. he, he's always suspect in my eyes. I, lo I love the guy. I love the guy, but he's, he's to his great credit? No, no. okay. <laughs> All right. No, but I'm citing Yair Golan, the uh, chief of, deputy chief of staff, who on Holocaust Memorial Day said, I see things that remind me of Germany in the 30s. Uh, that took a lot more guts than Barack, okay? He's, he labeled himself as someone who will not be the chief of staff if Netanyahu and Lieberman have anything to do with it, okay? Uh, but that empowered Barack uh, uh, as well, and I can no longer quarrel with my son. I can no longer yell at him about Mussolini because it's now mainstream, and he helped put it there, to his credit. Yeah. Uh, Ernie Benjamin, if I can put this into the language of labor negotiations for a moment, which I know better than any national, the main thing in your talk was to show why the parties have reached and why within the existing terms of discussion that impasse couldn't be resolved. When you were questioned, you began to come up with some alternative solutions where if you or I was handling a binding arbitration and we were the arbitrator, we could threaten the parties, if you don't do it yourselves, I'm going to do this and this and this, and push them to try to get their own thing. So that's two parts. That's one part toward the solution is to have some ideas like that, which you just have. The other part is who's going to do it. Now, in labor negotiations, we have structures that create a third party intervention of one kind or another, or some kind of thing. In this, the nearest to that is either the French initiative, the UN, or the United States, or the Arab states, or some combination thereof. Probably a combination, because while Israel will never trust the UN, the U.S. could create some security uh, guarantees and sort of balance the U.N. So, but it seems to me that what you are saying is that it's not enough to manage this conflict, which in my view, if we continue as it is, eventually the West Bank will just be absorbed in Israel and we get what you described from a very ugly by national state. So it seems to me what we have to be willing to look at is what combination of international pressures can combine with what combination of the kind of ideas you suggested that might get us past this impasse. All right, let me begin by noting that all the breakthroughs to Arab-Israel peace have been bilateral secret negotiations, okay? The closest we came to a third party was the Norwegian government, which basically was a labor government, and what you saw in action here was the global labor, the global uh, labor party mafia. Uh, the Labor Party in Israel, the Labor Party in Norway, and, and the PLO managed to wiggle its way into the international, whatever, union of labor parties. Uh, but they, they would walk out of the room and let, let the two sides talk. But the breakthrough with Egypt, uh, the breakthrough, the, the Oslo breakthrough, the peace with uh, Jordan. Uh, one might argue that one of the reasons the negotiations with Syria failed was precisely because they refused to sit alone with us in the room in some secret location and, and thrash these things out. Uh, that's what's happened so far. And that's a, that's a, ca a word of caution against the efficacy of uh, uh, international mediation. Uh, and it's by way of saying if Israelis and Palestinians can't work out most of this on their own, it's not going to be worked out. Now note, when there is a breakthrough, 
we go running to Washington, okay? In all of these cases, we went running to Washington. Give us your blessings. Give us, grease the wheels with the, the financial aid that you recruit and so on and so forth. Uh, that's number one. Number two, the two sides, or let's just take the two leaders uh, to simplify it, Bibi and Abu Mazen, are fortifying themselves precisely against this, this possibility. All right? Uh, and Bibi has done it very skillfully. He has radically improved Israel's strategic relationship with Russia, China, and India. All of the major powers that have problems with radical Islam, all of them, and are happy to talk to Israel about this, and are happy to pay at the most lip service to the Palestinian issue. And Russia is now our neighbor, okay? Once again, sitting in a neighboring country and uh, coordinating military affairs with us on a daily basis. This is not the Soviet Union that didn't talk to us, other than Primakov occasionally. But uh, uh, this is a very close uh, coordination, number one. Number two, uh, the surrounding Arab countries, who are also barely paying lip service to the Palestinian issue. They're much more preoccupied with ISIS. They're much more preoccupied with Iran and Hezbollah, as are we. And we have something to talk about. So they pay barely pay lip service. Number three, a, our Mediterranean strategic depth, which is a new concept, which is a both a second strike new, a second strike submarines, which I'm not referring to, uh, and but gas, okay. And here you have the extraordinary situation where the gas is being used to leverage enhanced Israeli strategic relations with Egypt, with Greece and Cyprus, the two most left-wing countries in the European Union. One has a communist president, the other has Syriza, okay? Uh, but they don't toe the left, leftist line against Israel. They have joint uh, air, air force and naval maneuvers with Israel. They need the gas, and they're afraid of Turkey. And they're afraid of Islam, Islam from Turkey, and Islam from Hezbollah on the Lebanese coast, which is a stone throw from Cyprus, okay? So they need us. And finally, despite everything, Turkey, which wants the gas as well, and which is at, at, uh, at loggerheads with Russia, with uh, a good part of the Arab world, uh, hard to explain itself to the United States. Uh, they need us too. Uh, and all of these, if, you're, if I'm Netanyahu, and I'm contemplating how am I going to manage if Obama takes some initiative and what if Kerry wants to come again and what if the French initiative gets going. I say, oh, wait a minute, I've got all these protective circles around me that will help me absorb any pressures and manage with them. Uh, and that's if there are pressures. And I, and, uh, the, I mean, I, I don't know what BB thinks of Trump, uh, uh, but Bibi's patron, Ed, Ed Sheldon Edelson, is now in the Trump camp, and uh, presumably Bibi's at ease with the possibility of a Trump uh, presidency, uh, and the European Union is in disarray. If it, if, if it wants to be a mediator or whatever, I mean, if you want to point to someone who might feel empowered to be a mediator, it's Putin. Then I'm already there. I have good relations with the Palestinians, with the with the, the, this more secular Arab world, or the anti-Islamist Arab world, have excellent relations with the Israelis. Uh, but even, even here, it's hard for me to, there have, if you go back to uh, the annals of Israeli-American interaction, there have been times when the United States brutally and successfully pressured Israel. Uh, and it didn't take much. Next six shipment of F-16s is on ice, okay? Uh, it didn't take much. But under present circumstances, I don't, frankly, I don't see that happening, number one. Number two, uh, there's no way really the United States can pressure Abu Mazen. And Abu Mazen, if Bibi has all these circles to, uh, of shock absorbers, Abu Mazen has the Arab world. And I'll give you just one illustration. Martin Indyk, a few months ago, speaking in Israel, uh, relates how working with Kerry on the 2013-2014 initiative, 
they tried to sell Abu Mazen on the notion of recognizing Israel as a Jewish state, and Abu Mazen said no. So they went to Cairo, and they talked to the Arab League ambassadors in Cairo. I'm, and this is what Martin related. And they agreed that, that Palestine, not they, Palestine would recognize Israel as a Jewish state. And Martin comes back to Abu Mazen, and he says, you know, I have now the imprimatur of the Arab League, uh, so get with the game. And Abu Mazen says, I'll get back to you. And he goes to Cairo, and he changes the decision. Abu Mazen, I think, can, uh, uh, I think it's a, uh, it's a pipe dream of the Israeli right that uh, the Arab world can compel Abu Mazen to make very, very, uh, what for him are very, very existential uh, uh, concessions. That might change after Abu Mazen. Maybe the Arab world would behave differently. But he, too, has given himself the capacity to rebuff uh, international pressure. So it, it's a tall order. Let's take one more. Let's take it together. Okay, Marshall. Marshall Krieger, tiny questions and what you had First of all, if it's the case that Israel has a water glut, why is the West Bank still have a water deficit? Secondly, if it was my understanding, that they had worked out a way to manage refugees by recognizing the right of return, but implementing it in a way that was not at all a threat to Israel. So I'm just wondering why you think that that quote 3967 issue is necessarily a discussion. By paradox, I have to stop. By the way, that said to me that if we all forgot about a state and just asked for our civil rights, Israel would run out civil rights, so well, that is we, equal citizenship. We, yes, if we just have a, he said, he, he, who is this talking, not yeah. official. Yeah. If all the East Jerusalem signed up to be citizens. Which they can do. Well, of course. And then it will run after us. What, meaning what? Meaning that if Solicit we, if we, if recruit we, recruit us if, to do this. If, no, if we become Ah, the citizens and demand equal rights. Israel will sue for a two-state solution. They'll say, yes, have a state, have a yeah. state. So from that question, from the paradigm shift, what if the American Jewish community stop thinking about Palestinian state and just started thinking and talking about equal rights, civil rights both in Israel and equal rights in Palestinian state? Would that change the situation from a paradigm, from your paradigm point of view? Uh, I have a great memory, Marshall, but it's very short. So I'm going to start with the last question, uh, and then you'll maybe you'll remember what you asked because I won't. Uh, it, all right, it hasn't been tried, mind you. Now there, yeah, there is a school of thought among Palestinians. There always has been that that's exactly what they should do, uh, and yet others, other wise Palestinians, say. You know, the, yeah, if this happens, it'll be disastrous for the Israelis, but it'll be disastrous for us because there's going to be bloodshed and, and, and strife and conflict, and do we really want to turn into Lebanon? Uh, so it hasn't been tried. Um, and so, I, yeah, I mean, yeah. surely a majority of Israelis would be very frightened of that possibility if they thought in some way it was going to be imposed upon us, and that might indeed loosen us up. But it doesn't loosen up the Palestinian conditions, and they have a lot more patience. And so we're still stuck. If we go back to the same paradigm of Oslo, uh, and Israel is more flexible negotiating, the Palestinians will be less flexible. And uh, that's my scenario. But it's it's an interesting thought. Uh, water. Why why doesn't the West Bank have more water? Why doesn't Gaza have more water? It's a good question. If we have a water surplus. Uh, I don't know that it's enough to satisfy all the Gazan cities, especially. Uh, but yes, we should be doing more. Now, uh, why not Gaza? Because Gaza is under siege. Uh, a, if that's wise or not is another question, particularly when it comes to water. Why not the West Bank? There's no good answer. 
the settlers have swimming pools and water, and Palestinians still have to collect rainwater. Uh, and there's no good excuse for it when we have, when, when we, we can snap our fingers and build another desalination plant on the coast and dedicate it just to the Palestinians. Uh, and, you know, in a, in a perfect world, we could provide water to southern Syria, which is dry. Uh, and we, as I said, to, we're more generous with Jordan, uh, probably could give a, more there as well. Now, in between, there was another yeah, question. Oh, why is right of return existential? Did they work out of okay. methodology mm -hmm. at Tala? Yeah. Look, I have sat down with Palestinians and worked out verbal form, okay? Uh, El Barak, as prime minister, got up in front of the Knesset in 1999 and he quoted verbatim what Halil Shikaki and I wrote. Okay, Israel recognizes uh, the suffering inflicted on the Palestinians in the events of 1948 and in the framework of a peace process will do everything to, etc., etc., etc. And it, Geneva has a formula and Taba has a formula. Uh, None of them formally approved by the Palestinians, okay? Uh, and none of them, to the best of my knowledge, a closing the gap between a, a readiness, an, agree, an agreement to accept X number of refugees, which is easy, and a, 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 the, a, a formula that doesn't open us up to a situation in which uh, it facilitates a peace process and at that point the Palestinian education system begins saying uh, or continues to say what it says to this day which is the Jews have no rights in the Holy Land, the Jews are not a people, they have no roots here and uh, they and but now adding and they acknowledge they acknowledge that the state of Israel was born in sin. And this is not a formula for peaceful coexistence. I, be, I would prefer to set it aside, since it, I don't think there's really room for agreement on this issue or on the question of who owns the Temple Mount. Set it aside, leave the status quo. Every five years we'll sit down and revisit it. Uh, we'll talk about it again, but let's get on with life. There's one Palestinian politician who's talked that way, and that's Salam Fayyad. State building. His hero is Ben Gurion. Leave all this other philosophical stuff aside. Let's let's do something for our people. And he's totally sidelined. He, he barely has an NGO dedicated to these issues, which is dragged in front of Palestinian courts regularly on trumped-up charges of tax evasion. That's where he is today uh, with with that concept. I'm sorry to say. <laughs>